Good day. My name is Giovanni Camacho Espesor. I'm a professor of political science, international relations, and international law at the Department of Political Science, College of Social Sciences and Humanities at the Mindanao State University in General Santos City in the Southern Philippines. In this lecture, I'll be talking about theories and international relations, and in particular, the theory of realism, which has historically been regarded the dominant theory of international relations and a point of reference for alternative theories. Realism aspires to be supra-historical, explaining in all epochs the fundamental features of international politics, especially conflict and war. Emerging in the 1930s, realism polemical target was the progressive reformist optimism connected with liberal internationalists, particularly American President Woodrow Wilson. Against this optimism, realism comported a more pessimistic outlook, which was felt to be necessary in the tragic realm of international politics. President Woodrow Wilson led the United States into World War I, promising to make the world safe for democracy. Advocating liberal internationalism, he called for collective security and national self-determination. He wanted democratic states to create the League of Nations as a partnership for peace in the new world order. Realism has long tradition of political thought, dating back to Thucydides, Niccolo Machiavelli, and Thomas Hobbes. The ideas of these philosophers have become the point of departure in the study of conflict and power politics. Accordingly, conflict is inevitable, even necessary in international politics. When disputes cannot be resolved peacefully or diplomatically, force and ultimately war is a decisive means of settling matters. When it comes to morality, Realism does not abandon morality altogether, but it does extol a morality specific to the state, which is its raison d'etat or reason of state, and to state men by imposing some ethics of responsibility. So although it rejects realism morality as the starting point for the theory and practice of international relations, it does not eschew morality altogether. So unlike its rival theory, liberalism, that puts too much emphasis on morality, realism does not put too much importance on morality, but it does not abandon or neglect morality altogether. One major strand of thought in realism is classical realism. Martin White, in the 1950s, was talking about anarchy, power politics, and warfare, which are prescriptive characteristics of classical realism. Its key tenets emphasize the concepts of anarchy and the historical supposition that international relations are unavoidably shaped by power politics and war. Using historical accounts, puts uh, emphasis on the recurrence and repetition of war, such as uh, the existence of the two world wars followed by the Cold War. Most favorite of all to see Didier catchphrase repeated in international relations courses the world over and the founding text of realist political analysis, the strong do what they can. The weak suffer what they must. It is taken from the famous debate that Thucydides evokes between the Athenians and the people of the island of Melos. The Athenians had demanded that the neutral state of Melos come over to the Athenian side in a war between Athens and Sparta. When the Melians resisted, the two sides debated the issue. The representative of Imperial Athens put forward a ter terrifying version of might is right. Justice only existed between equals, they asserted. Otherwise, the strong ruled the weak, so the power of Athens could always be 
would always ride roughshod over the aspiration of a small state. In The Prince, written by Machiavelli, there is an emphasis on the cyclical conception of history based on the recurrent nexus of necessity, chance, and human decision. Using a modern expression, international relations are conceived as a realm of recurrence and repetitions where political actions is most regularly necessitous. Autonomy of politics from other realms of human actions, most especially its ultimate independence from morality and law, politics has its own rules and cannot be reduced to or contained by moral or legal rules since it must respond to the demands of necessity. So therefore, when states go to war, they're actually acting as uh, based on the demand of necessity and they, man, and they must not be uh, prevented uh, because of law and uh, morality. Machiavelli puts primacy of the political. Conflict and competition for power are inevitable and irrepressible. And therefore, international politics should be free from ethical prescription, meaning there is no room to idealize or to subscribe to the utopian idea. Each car regarded Machiavelli as the first important political realist because he deduces three essential realist tenets. First, history is a consequence of cause and effect whose course can be analyzed and understood by intellectual efforts, but not directed by imagination. Meaning, Machiavelli is using historical account to explain realism, especially the recurrence of war and power politics. Second, theory does not create practice, but practice theory. And third, which is the most contentious of all, morality is the product of power. Thomas Hobbes, in his work on Leviathan, which talks about the state of nature, describes international relations as a state of war due to the absence of an overarching sovereign power. States or sovereign states do not recognize any other higher authority above themselves, and as a consequence of the absence of these of the of a world government, nothing can impede the normal recurrence of war and states are responsible for their own preservation, meaning they cannot rely on the support or protection of other states for their survival and self-preservation. Hans Morgenthau, who is a German-Jewish uh, realist scholar, wrote The Politics Among Nations in 1948, where he echoed Friedrich Nietzsche's uh, sentiment that the tragic presence of evil in all political actions and the lust for power manifests itself in the desire to maintain the reins of one's own person with regards to others, to increase it or to demonstrate it. Morgenthau stresses the corrupting and pervasive influence of power on human relations, including international relations, and he places power at the center of international political universe, declaring international politics, like all politics, is a struggle for power. Another realist scholar, Raymond Aron, in 1966, talks about eternal quest for security. In the context of international anarchy, security is one of the interest. As in the state of nature, self-help is the only certain means to the uncertain ends of self-preservation or survival. Since sovereign states do not recognize any other higher authority, Nothing other than states themselves can prevent or counter the use of force in their relations. 
which justifies the ambitions of most states to further develop their military. It is only through the balance of power that states alone or true alliances can check the power of other states. It can also preserve a state's independent existence from threat, aggression, and hegemony. Balance of power is the only real means of achieving common security. So the, the idea of balance of power is actually the basis why the Soviets' states formed the Axis alliance and the, the liberal states created the, uh, the allies uh, during World War II. Let's talk about diplomacy and how do realists view diplomacy. There is an agreement among scholars such as Aaron, White, Kissinger, and Cannon that diplomacy is the art of communication and negotiation between powers. Cultural and ideological factors matter because states that belong to the same type and share common policy goals prefer resolving disputes through the work of trusted diplomacy. Hans Morgenthau in 1966 said that diplomacy has four tasks. First, define its goal with a view to the power available for the pursuit of these goals. Second, assess the goals of powers of other nations. Third, determine the level of compatibility of these different goals. And fourth, pursue the goals with appropriate means. Therefore, According to this view of uh, Morgenthau on diplomacy, it is the only defense against war, which is not seen as an anomaly since to fail in any of these four tasks may jeopardize peace. In the realist understanding, diplomacy is included among and is dependent on other, more material capabilities, hence it reflects state power. On the other hand, the quality of diplomacy may modify the value of other elements of state power. Thus, skillful diplomacy can create or can increase the power of a nation beyond what one would expect it to be in the view of other material factors. So therefore, diplomacy is just actually another tool to increase state power. Aside from other material factors, especially the ownership of sophisticated weapons and powerful armed forces. On the next part of the lecture, we'll be talking about structural or neorealism and offensive realism. Thank you.